So, we all have our stories to tell. They may take the form of life stories, or they may focus on segments of our lives, or certain events and certain circumstances. And there are inevitably highs and lows, and sad times and happy times. And sometimes our stories might be easy to relate, sometimes difficult, sometimes even painful. And often, the very act of writing, as those of you who journal regularly will know, can bring a certain measure of healing. When a Christian crafts his or her story in such a way as to foreground the centrality of God in its unfolding, it becomes so much more than just a story. God's loving hand is recognized, indeed celebrated, and the healing and the comforting of the Holy Spirit is laid bare. Then the story becomes a Christian testimony. And when a Christian shares such a testimony with all the angst and the vulnerability that goes into it, he or she goes on mission. This is what Jan has done. She's taken her story, she's transformed it into a testimony, and as she shares it with us now, she's going on mission. She loves the Lord with all of her being, and through both the happy and the sad in her life, she recognizes God's hand, and she celebrates his involvement without the slightest hesitation. And having been very happily married to her for 22 years, I have no, no hesitation in vouching for this. And so it's my prayer tonight that God will speak through Jan as she shares, and that each of you will catch something of this that you will receive easily, that you will be inspired, that you will be convicted. And then, perhaps, that some of you might feel yourselves to be inclined to go back to your own stories, to transform it, to turn it into a testimony, and one day also go on mission as you share. It's now my pleasure, Mrs. J, to hand over to you. Everybody. You'll see up on the slide that the topic of my sharing tonight is based on Psalm 30 verse 5, which says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Even in the darkest, most painful nights, we can trust that there is joy to come. We may not know the length of the night, but we are encouraged to set our sights on the joy to come. True joy is found in Jesus alone, as we abide in him, both in the night and in the morning, and allow his truth and love to fill our hearts and to fill us with joy. At 63, I'll be reflecting on my story, which is actually his story. <laughs> Please have a look at the next slide. Um, can you see the earth in outer space? Um, can you see Red Point there? <laughs> can you see the person you're sitting next to there? And just have a look at it. We are um, one person out of seven billion on one planet, out of eight planets, orbiting one star, out of 300 billion stars in one galaxy, out of 200 billion to two trillion galaxies. That gives us some perspective. Because we have a God who is so huge, and yet he is interested in each one of us and our stories. All of us sitting in this room tonight have stories to tell. But tonight it's my privilege to share mine. And I want to thank you for coming to listen. And especially people who have come from outside of Red Point. And you're going to hear me referring to VFC and to Red Point. I just want to clear that up for the visitors. This church used to be called Victory Faith Centre, VFC, and then the name was changed to Redemption Point Church, or affectionately known as Red Point. I'm going to be using my notes so that I don't lose my train of thought, and also in the interest of trying to honour time constraints. As I share my story with you tonight, I'm going to present something of a timeline that pulls a thread through my life just to provide some context, and then I'll pause at certain things along the way to show you his incredible kindness, 
in the midst of what has sometimes have been very, very long nights. But joy does come in the morning. And as every good story begins, once upon a time, a little girl was born on Monday the 19th of September 1960 to proud parents, John and Isabel Shemelt. They named me Janet, which means apparently gift from God, or God is gracious. Can you see the second picture? That was my first and last attempt at modeling. <laughs> I was christened at the Allerwell Street Congregational Church. Older folk here will know exactly where Allerwell Street was. Don't ask me what it's called now. In Durban. And when I was a bit older, my dad used to drop me there at Sunday school every Sunday with a few pennies for collection. It was here at Sunday school that seeds were sown. And gently and steadily, these were watered by the Holy Spirit. I was sent to a Catholic school, and as I got older, I went to an Anglican youth till my parents decided it was too <coughs> political. Then I moved to a Methodist youth, but the talent was better at the Presby youth. And on Friday evenings, I would go to Shaw or synagogue with my best friend who lived up the road. In 1972, I was baptized, wait for this, by a nun in the Holy Spirit. And I tend to use that as a marker for my walk in a meaningful relationship with Jesus. That's 52 years ago, hey? How kind is God that I can be standing here tonight 52 years later? I love Jesus and I led my maternal grand, my mom and my sister to the Lord. My family dynamics were not great at all. From the age of six months, my dad was unfaithful to my mom, and divorce was often spoken about, although they never actually got divorced. My dad was an alcoholic, and at times physically violent with my mom, which was really horrible to witness. When I matriculated, I opted to get away from home, and I went to um, the University of Natal, Peter Maritzburg campus, where I graduated with a BA Honours and a higher diploma in education and the Department of Education sent me to Wartburg for my first teaching post. Well, after meeting every beer drinking, badminton playing, German farmer, <laughs> I realized that I'd end up a spinster if I let them stay there. And so I applied for a transfer to a men's in Toti High School. It was in Toti that I met my former husband. We were both in the worship band at the Methodist Church, and later founder members of Toti Christian Fellowship. When the relationship got serious, my dad's counsel was that it wasn't the best match. Probably should have listened to him. But because we were both Christians, and by then chemistry was working overtime, I thought this is a good relationship. The counsel that we got from the elders of the church was kind of some sort of pre-marriage course, and everyone was just happy that the pot had found its lid, okay, and that we were getting married. We were married on the 21st of September, 1985. I wore my mom's wedding dress, which my gran had lovingly made for her. I was excited. I was in love. I was full of hope and committed to making the marriage work. But there were signs of cracks in the marriage. The first one being, after about 18 months, my former husband leaving me for about four months. We patched things up. And after four years of marriage, we had Amy, and three years later, Gareth. By the time Gareth arrived, I'd moved to Moat Park Girls High School. And after a short time, I applied for a position at the former Edgewood College of Education, Net Omdihuk. And in 1994, I took up a senior lectureship there. At the same time, we as a family moved into a home in 7th Avenue. You might know where that is. Most of you probably drove down 7th Avenue to get here. Without focusing on the ins and outs of the demise of the marriage, ultimately ending with infidelity, let me say that this was the most painful experience, especially because this is not what I wanted to happen. My former husband left us in January 1995 and headed to Cape Town. He finally divorced me in December 1998. In the intervening years, I did everything possible a Christian could do in terms of praying, fasting, standing on the word, words of prophecy, etc., etc. 
1997, he lost his job in Cape Town, came back to Durban, and said to the kids and myself that he was coming back to us once he packed up his belongings in Cape Town. We were so elated, and the whole church was celebrating his prayers had been answered and all the rest. On the 2nd of June, 1997, I received a call from him, from him to say he changed his mind. Turns out he'd been seeing somebody, decided to throw his lot in with her, and he subsequently married her. Oh my word, what pain again. I think the second betrayal was worse than the first, actually, especially for the children. I did not receive, and when I say not a cent, I mean literally not one cent maintenance. And I used to sit at the Pine Town Courts together with some of my Edgewood students who were in the same boat. You can imagine how humbling that was. I used to sell creative stationery, like notebooks, files, all that sort of stuff from my boot. And the children and I would set up early in the morning at various markets on Saturdays just to make ends meet. I just want to say that I have tithed for as long as I can remember. And I continue to do so during this very difficult time. And I can testify to God's provision and His goodness over the years. God showed me that my marriage was like a building with cracks that kept appearing. Some of you might relate to this. And that while we plastered over them, the foundation was severely compromised. Only the chief engineer, Jesus, could underpin it. However, this had to be something that we both wanted. And I was devastated when the divorce finally went through. In 1995, I joined what was then VFC. And this included getting fully involved in the life of the church. We were at both Sunday meetings, prayer meetings, home group meetings, church camps, every aspect of church life. The children would bring their two days to church and fall asleep during the evening meetings. And I've got photos of them with many other children um, from this church body and the trees on the campus, etc. Made we have some wonderful memories. In many circles, divorced women are made to feel less than or made to feel disqualified, or quite frankly, a threat. I'm grateful that the elders in this church entrusted me to lead a home group of about 35 young adults. Some of them are sitting here tonight. Two have been one of them. Amy and Gareth love the interaction and the love that they received as part of a church family. I asked God for grace, for singleness, moving forward or ask for him to please bring somebody into my life. In the seven years on my own with the children, I came to know Jesus as my husband in a very real way. He truly was my provider, my companion, the lover of my soul. And what I'm about to say, I'm not saying lightly, but I think I would go through the same challenging times on my own again, just for the nuggets of gold that I experienced during that time of singleness as I allowed him to heal and restore me. For divorced or widowed folk who might be sitting here tonight, can I implore you not to go looking? When you are vulnerable, you will attract men and women who can sniff out your vulnerability. Wait, let God bring someone into your life or ask him for the grace to remain single. Leading up to and after the divorce seemed like a heck of a long night, but I chose to find joy while waiting for the morning. And then a new chapter started. Brian Jarvis was actually my former boss in his position as Deputy Rector of Edgewood College. His wife had cancer, and she died a week before my precious mom, who also had cancer, in November 2000. In the same year, the government, in all its lack of wisdom, um, incorporated colleges of education into the universities. Those of us at Edgewood College experienced hectic job insecurity. We had to apply for jobs with what was then the former University of Natal, and not every applicant was successful. However, Brown and I were both appointed to the Faculty of Education on the Edgewood campus, which is now part of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. That is where I continue to work 
And that is where I will retire at the end of next year. Back then, the workplace was not a happy environment for those of us who had been appointed from the college. We were made to feel like second-class citizens because we were considered to be just mere teachers. We weren't academics because we didn't have PhDs. Never mind that we had the skills and the experience of actually having taught in the classroom. In 2001, something changed in my relationship with Brian. I received hugs when I arrived at work, <laughs> and again when I left to go home. But he was useless with the telephone. Even now, he hates the telephone. So I was very confused, because I thought if you smart somebody, you find them. <laughs> One day he arrived in my office to inform me that he'd really prayed about it and he felt God telling him that I was the woman for him. Coming, <laughs> coming from a rather traditional Methodist background, when he came to our first VFC corporate prayer meeting, he thought I was part of a cult. <laughs> anyway, he persevered, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and the rest is his story. <laughs> When we spoke to the elders here about getting engaged, they asked us to wait and to really consider if we were both free to marry, especially me as a divorcee. And although I'd known Brian for eight years and we'd worked together as colleagues, he was an unknown quantity to VFC and the elders in particular. And I just want to say that I so appreciate that the elders were protecting me as a daughter in this house and also the group of young folk that I led in the home group. If he had been a charlatan, can you imagine the damage that would have been done? But the story ended well. <laughs> we got married on the 1st of June, 2002, and I gained not only a husband, but a precious mother in love, affectionately called Brainy, and two daughters, and in years to come, four Brainy children. I just, I just put that photo up to show the company of witnesses because this was our home, my home. And so it was just so wonderful to have the community at our wedding. We started our married life with three children at home, Amy, Garrett, and Brian's youngest daughter. The older daughter had already moved into a place with her boyfriend, who is now her husband. Being acquainted to UKZN, the screws were on. I was now obliged to study further, horror of horrors. In 2008, at the age of 48, I graduated from Stellenbosch University with a master's degree. Oh, that wasn't enough. Then the pressure was on to get this German PhD. I graduated from Northwest University with my PhD in 2013, at the very tender age of 53. And Brian graduated with his from UKZN in 2015. Looking back now, I know that it wasn't actually about the degree or the title that goes with it. It was about God giving us a key to access spaces and people that we would otherwise not have accessed. Backtracking a bit to 2011, my daughter Amy gave birth to a little boy called Vernon. And in 2014, her second son, Reese, was born. On the 14th of February, 2015, Vernon was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and he died on the 20th of March the same year. In the midst of the pain, and I remember Brian and I going shopping in the spa, and we'd come from different sides down the aisle, and we just burst into tears there. It was really, very really painful. But there were things to be grateful for. The almost four years that we got to love this little boy, and the treasured memories that we have, our photo albums bear witness to this. Also, actually, God saved Vernon from a long journey ahead with chemo and everything that goes with it. We also had the privilege of being with Vernon when he died. And just before he died, we read him a story about heaven and we told him where he was going and it was fine. As believers, while the pain is huge, we don't grieve as those without hope. Joy will come in the morning, albeit in eternity, when we are reunited with him. This past Wednesday actually marked the ninth anniversary of Vernon's death. And this is always a tender day, 
as we remember this very precious little boy. Little did we know that that grief journey that we walked with Vernon would be a forerunner to a similar journey to come. Talking about our children, we can raise our kids in the way of the Lord, but as they get older, they have to take ownership of their faith. As Christian parents, we often feel so disqualified when our children walk away from God and seemingly go off the rails. I'm one of those parents who had to work through this burden of feeling like a bad parent because both my children have walked less than exemplary paths. In Gareth's case, this led to a drug addiction and a journey that is painful, exhausting, and everything that is ugly. Drug addicts believe that the next fix will be the last and then they'll be okay. But to get that fix, they often lie, steal, manipulate, and whatever else they have to do to get the money they need. Gareth and I were particularly close, sharing the same sense of humor. He was a gentle giant and a beautiful boy, with a kind, kind heart. However, he chose to live on the edge and he dabbled with drugs and he ended up a heroin addict. When his name came up on my phone, my chest would tighten with anxiety because I knew what was coming. There was going to be some incredible, incredible story as to why he needed to borrow money. In 2016, thanks so much, Matt. In 2016, things got really bad. And eventually he agreed to us booking him into a rehab in the Cape where he was working at the time as a rope access technician. He went through hell with, with withdrawal symptoms as he detoxed. It was a very tough time for him. But I later found an entry that he had written in his journal, and I'm sure you've all read it by now, um, while he was at Hope Farm, indicating that he was turning his face back to God. In April 2017, we saw Gareth in Cape Town. It was so, so wonderful to spend time with him, and he was clean. His eyes weren't funny, and he wasn't like on the tape or anything. He was, was just my beautiful boy. <laughs> the night of the 5th of August, after attending my 40th school reunion, we had a great WhatsApp video call with Gareth. Eventually, we had to say to him, listen, Gareth, the bullies need to go to bed now. <laughs> If I'd known what was coming, I would have kept him talking all that. Five o'clock Sunday morning, the 5th of August, we received the call to say that Gareth had died. He had used heroin again. At nine o'clock, we were here at church. We wanted to be with our church family, the family who had walked through so much with us over the years. It was such a very, very painful time. I remember groaning with pain as Brian and I lay in bed, the cry coming from my big toe all the way up. It was too, too sore. My beautiful boy was dead. I never dreamed that both my daughter and I would lose a son. These days when I think of Vernon, I think of Gareth and vice versa. Gareth's memorial took place here on the 19th of August 2017. And in fact, three of the songs that we sing tonight were songs that were played at his memorial, so they're very significant for us. The fridge magnet, yes, there it is. The fridge magnet that we gave folk who attended was based on John 12, 24. Paraphrased, this verse says that unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it never becomes anything more. But if it dies, it produces many others and it yields a rich harvest. For me, this is my hope, that in Gareth dying, the story we have to tell may produce fruit in terms of encouraging others, pretty much what I'm doing tonight. And this will give such purpose to Gareth's living and his dying. So, how to deal with this grief? How to find joy in the midst of it all? And again, I just realized there was so much to be grateful for. While Gareth was at Hope Farm, he was not allowed to have a cell phone. Anyway, on the 19th of September 2016, he managed to get someone to take a short video in which he wished me a very happy birthday. And so what a treasure this is. 
Every year on my birthday, Gareth gets to wish me happy birthday. In February 2017, he sent us a letter in which he took ownership of his choices. Do you mind if I read the letter to you? I know I can apologize until I'm blue in the face. Yet I know that won't ever fix what was broken or replace what I've stolen. And I don't just mean the physical items. Please hear this from the bottom of my heart, that I am truly sorry for the pain, heartache, and continuous stress that I've caused on so many occasions, and have let it affect not only you and Dad, but the people around you. If I can say thank you to you and Dad for never giving up on me, especially you, Dad, I know I'm not your real son, but you have never made that a known point to me. No matter what the situation was, you are an outstanding husband to mom, and forever adopting, uh, adapting, <laughs> what she has to do a lot of, I admire. You have been a loving and understanding father to me and a real role model. Mom, the same I can say about you. Please don't think, if you had maybe done things differently, my choices wouldn't have been what they were. I need you to know, none of my doings were your fault. And you know, I think that Gareth in that letter achieved something which many people never achieve in their whole lifetime. People go through life always blaming somebody else for something that goes wrong. But Gareth took ownership of his choices. And any parent, your default setting when things go wrong with your kids is what could I have done differently? Where did I go wrong? And in that letter, which is such a gift, he actually said, Mom and Dad, you couldn't have done anything differently. It's my fault. So you can imagine how precious that letter is to us. I'm grateful for the time in Cape Town when he was clean. I'm grateful for Saturday the 29th of July 2017, as Brian and I were at the Johnny Clegg concert, and Gareth phoned this huge theological thing. Mom, he said, I want to ask you about salvation, and in particular, the thief on the cross. Even though he was a thief, would he go to heaven? So we had this whole discussion, I mean, never knowing what was coming. I'm grateful for the 5th of August when we had that special WhatsApp video call when he was dressed in a pink dressing gown, cooking eggs on the stove. We were chatting and laughing. It was just such a special memory to have. Gareth had turned his face back to God. He died a drug addict. But like the thief on the cross who died a thief, he would have known Jesus' forgiveness. God, in his grace, saved them even in their last breath. I'm also get very grateful that Gareth's death was not violent. After we got the call that he had died, when I was in the shower before we came to church, I felt as if God had allowed a little window for me to sense Gareth saying to me, Mom, I know that you love me enough to forgive me, and I know that your faith is strong enough that you guys will get through this. And no, I haven't heard him since then, but it was just like a, like a sense, and that was also just such a treasure. We could not have loved Gareth more unconditionally, and we knew that he loved us totally, so there was no unfinished business between us. What happened doesn't make God any less God. In fact, God rescued Gareth. Because if you think about it, if you used heroin, that whole Jody cycle would have started again. Having gone through Vernon's death, Brian and I knew something of this grief journey, and, and in particular how we grieve. There's no right and wrong way to grieve, okay? But we knew what grief looked like for us. We so appreciate something else that we can be grateful for is the love and the support of the Red Point community, but also other friends um, that we've brought long journeys with in our lives. This is gonna sound weird, but for those of you who maybe lost somebody, <laughs> We can be grateful for the comfort of routine. Routine of like waking up, getting out of bed, making your bread, brushing your teeth. It helps to get you into the day. Otherwise, you can, you can stay in a little heap and feel sorry for yourself. But actually, routine is a comfort. And in fact, at that time, it was a really bad timing, Gareth. But anyway, at that time, I was involved in a huge infrastructural project at Edgewood. All the painting that you see and all the rest of it. And I couldn't just drop that. So in the midst of this lot, I actually saw that through. But in some ways, it was also part of this routine. As with 
Vernon, the missing of Gareth is still huge. But again, we don't grow believers those without hope. Joy will come when we are reunited with him in eternity. Ten days after Gareth died, on Wednesday the 16th, my dad died. Once again, we see the kindness of God. The day before he died in Crompton Hospital, I had the opportunity to pray with him, and he committed his life to Jesus. Talk about lastminute.com, but I mean, how incredible is that, eh? I can only say that those two weeks in August 2017 were crazy, but there were many God kindnesses in the midst. In the midst of grief, God can be so kind, and he understands our pain. In March 2020, Brian's precious mom died at the age of 96. It was also another kindness that she died just before the COVID lockdown. Rainy was blind and deaf by then, and she only knew us by touch. So there was absolutely no way we could have communicated to her while we couldn't see her because of the lockdown. And so God graciously took her, literally just before lockdown. Shortly after she died, for reasons that I'm not going to go into because I do not wish to dishonor anyone, but Brian's daughters canceled Brian and I. And that means that we do not have access to our four grandchildren. This is another loss that we've had to grieve, and it remains a long night, but we trust for joy to come one day. I'm so very grateful to the Lord for his kindness in protecting our marriage. There are so many things along the way that could have taken us out, and I thank God for his kindness in actually drawing us closer to one another. Studying simultaneously at PhD level, where I went to bed at 3 a.m. and Brian got up at 3 a.m. to work, while holding down jobs and raising children, the negative influences of my former husband operating through my daughter, and losing a grandson and a son, the rejection by Brian's daughters, and the list continues. But God, through the dark nights, some of them longer than others, joy has come in the morning. I need to add, and that before we knew what lay ahead, God blessed us with Cole and Lexi Krauser, who were born in 2007. Andrea, their mom, was in my home group all those many years ago, and through a series of events, her story to tell, we became intricately involved in each other's lives. God knew that in 2020, we would no longer have access to our four grandchildren, but he had already gifted us de facto with two precious grandchildren whom we love dearly and who, in whose lives we daily play a role. Amy's little boy, Reese, is also an absolute delight to us. God is still writing his story in my life until the day I step into eternal joy where it is always morning. So after hearing all of this, you may say to me, Jan, you don't know what I've been through. And you don't know the long night that I'm experiencing. And I don't. You may have experienced the loss of a spouse. You may be in an abusive relationship. You may have suffered financial loss. You may be battling a debilitating disease. There are so many permutations. However, what I can promise you is that God is faithful. He knows what you are going through. And if you choose to keep your gaze on him, joy will come in the morning, albeit in eternity. There are many, but I have selected a few of the scriptures that I've meditated on that have strengthened me through it all. And I'm going to read them, and I'll ask you to allow God's word to minister to you as I do so. I've drawn from various translations. People with their minds set on you, you keep completely whole, steady on their feet, because they keep at it and they don't quit. Depend on God and keep at it, because in the Lord you have a sure thing. He says to us, don't panic. I'm with you. There's no need to fear, for I am your God. I'll give you strength. I'll help you. I'll hold you steady and keep a firm grip on you. No one who hopes in me ever regrets it. He says, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. 
So I can say with confidence that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. In Lamentations we read that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And thank goodness they are new every morning because I run out the night before. So they are new every morning and His faithfulness is great. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And the last scripture, I can just do this. Blessed is the woman or the man who sticks with God. He or she is like a tree, putting down roots near the river, never dropping a leaf in the hottest summers, serene and calm through droughts and bearing fresh fruit in every season. So, I've said a lot. Here are some key points to take home with you. First one, God is absolutely kind and faithful all the time. Gratitude, I have found, is the antidote to grief. Grace is the fragrance of the broken. When you've been through pain and brokenness, and you've allowed God to bring you healing, you have increased capacity to be gracious. God ministers to us through his church. I cannot stress enough the importance of not trying to go it alone, but rather knitting into a community of believers. True joy is found in God alone. He is our only hope, and we are encouraged to set um, our sights on the joy to come, whether it's here or in eternity. This hope we have is Jesus. What happens next weekend, Easter weekend, is the key to our hope and joy. We cannot earn our way into heaven. It is only through his death and resurrection that we have the assurance of eternity. As Brian said at the beginning, let our stories become testimonies that could well become the key that unlocks someone else's prison, bringing them hope and encouragement. Let us continue to allow God to write his story through our lives. He's not finished yet. <laughs>